Welcome to Behind the Muscle Podcast. Today's guest is an IFBB Pro bodybuilder. Today's guest is Brent Swanson. Brent, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. For, for sure. So Brent, I like to start each podcast off with uh, asking my uh, guests the same two questions. So the first question I have for you is, who are a few of your favorite bodybuilders of all time? Man, that's a, that's a loaded question. Obviously, I think the best to ever do it is Ronnie Coleman. Um, when you talk about size, when you talk about shape, when you talk about conditioning, he kind of checks all those boxes. And then, you know, I think what's, again, makes a great bodybuilder is how they give back and what they do. And I thought that he did a great job of being, you know, an ambassador for the sport. You know, he, he, there's never a bad word said about him. He was just a really good down to earth guy. So to me, Ronnie is here and then everybody else is kind of a little below him. Doesn't mean that, you know, I don't have other favorites, but he's just kind of, to me, the gold standard on how you should live your life, you know, um, in the weight room, outside of the weight room, you know. I respect him a lot too because he was a cop you know he was working four 10-hour shifts a week while he was winning most of his olympias i think it was wasn't until he was already you know midway through his run to where he actually retired and uh stopped awesome now i want to i i kind of want i'm curious to to ask you this uh kind of branching off from that question um kind of when you started getting into bodybuilding and started progressing was there an athlete or was there a bodybuilder brent that you kind of like looked up to their physique saying like, Hey, I think maybe I want to maybe look like them or my physique is comparable to their physique. Is there somebody like that or not? Not, not really. Um, the whole reason why I got into the sport, I'm 35 now I'll be 36. I started competing actually when I was 20 years old and, you know, back then <laughs> I'm not old, but you know, I am, I'm getting older, you know, back then there wasn't, you know, not everybody had a prep coach. It seems like everybody who competes now as a prep coach, there's a lot of things that we had to do back then, like trial and error, or if there's a guy who looked halfway decent to compete at your gym, you know, ask him, hey, like, what are you doing, right? You know, so I feel like now, I feel like it took a little bit longer for me to get where I am just because I didn't have a top tier coach basically spoon feeding me everything. Now I'm kind of turning that around. It's great because, you know, I've learned a lot between trial and error and I had to figure a lot out myself. Um, so I, my mindset was not like, I want to look like this person. It's just that I wanted to be the best version of myself. Um, I'm also, I think bodybuilders too can either be one or two ways. I think most bodybuilders mind is never clear on how they look i think most people are either think they're worse than they are they're kind of narcissistic like i am like i you know until i look back at pictures i never think that i'm anything you know i'm very hard on myself or i think you have some people who you know they do one local show and say hey i'm gonna be the next mr olympia and they're just way they have no idea you know what um you know what it really takes to get to where they want to be so i do know in looking at myself though I know my strengths and weaknesses. Um, it's always been easy for me to pack on a ton of muscle, um, but um, I'm a type one diabetic. I've been once I've been four years old. Um, with the insulin comes easy to, you know, gain this size, but also to diet down and get completely shredded. I've had to learn my body. And once I've learned it, my conditioning is a strong suit for me. Um, not to be more people as conditioned as I am or as hard as I get. But again, my waist is a little bit bigger. So when I go up against somebody who, let's say, you know, is 280 pounds on stage with a 32 inch waist, you know, and I'm in trouble a little bit, you know, but luckily those guys are kind of few and far between. Excellent. Now, the second question I kind of like to ask all my guests is at what age did you start lifting weights? And then why did you start lifting weights at that age, Brent? So I started lifting weights literally um, on a nonstop basis when I was 14 years old. And I'm OCD by nature. Um, I've kind of guided that into, you know, a positive thing rather than a negative thing. So my dad, who was a professional baseball player, took me to the weight room, showed me the basics when I was 14. And I kind of think in his mind, he was thinking, oh, he'll stick with this for a few weeks and not stop. But literally, I was dragging him to the gym <laughs> at that point, like every day, you know, after school, before school. And I never really stopped actually weight training since I've been 14 years old on a consistent basis. There's never been a time where I've taken like a lot of time off. Um, as far as competing goes, I was in college and there was an older bodybuilder in the gym. And he said, have you ever thought about bodybuilding? I'm like, 
bodybuilding like I don't, I don't know. So I went to a show, saw a show, did my first show, and then kind of was hooked on doing it and then have done it ever since. And I think, you know, growing up, I, uh, my dad always got the muscle magazines. I would always thumb through those and think, man, like if I could ever look like one of these guys one day, like that's the coolest thing ever. And also uh, my coach now, um, Chad Nichols and his wife, Kim, they're actually from my hometown. And I can literally remember, and I tell him the story all the time, when I was like four or five years old, I can remember walking into Kroger's, which used to be Eagle's grocery store, and see them walking around and literally my jaw would just be down to my waist saying, oh my gosh, like, I want to look like that, you know, just just simple things that just stick in your mind, you know, that, you know, I just always looked up to bodybuilders and looking like that just because I thought it was, you know, the coolest thing ever. Excellent. Yeah, that's, that, I, I, that's awesome. I love it, man. Now, um, I want to touch on your childhood, your upbringing a little bit. You already brought up your dad. You started lifting weights at 14, but um, just talk about uh, where did you grow up and then talk about, you know, any sports you played, anything that you feel like shaped that childhood up to about high school. And then we'll transition from there, Brent. Yeah. So um, I was diagnosed being a type one diabetic when I was four years old. So the, I had to learn at a very young age how to manage that. And especially being four years old, you know, instead of playing with like trucks and video games and things like that, I was worried, hey, I don't feel quite right. Why don't I feel right? And then go and get my mom or my dad or whatever to figure out if my blood sugar is high or low and then how to deal with that. Um, looking back, I, I don't know how kids really do it just because when you're that young, you really don't know your body, but it kind of forces you at a young age to figure out, you know, how to how to navigate with having all of this so fast forward um to high school when sports started getting a little bit more intense um i played soccer basketball and baseball i was probably the best at baseball and soccer i was pretty good at um basketball i was just a little too short and the wrong skin color <laughs> um, but uh but yeah so um, I, uh, the reason why I started lifting weights is I was 16 years old, sophomore, and, um, I was 120 pounds at about five foot 10 and I hadn't hit puberty yet. I didn't even have to start shaving my face till I was a senior in high school. I was, um, didn't really go through puberty till about 18 years old. So it was like, I was a little boy playing against some, you know, grown men, it felt like. So got in the weight room and started, you know, the good habits with which my habits have always been good with eating because I am a diabetic. I never ate junk food, but just kind of transitioned and eating more protein, eating like I wanted to gain weight um, in a good way and lifting weights. And I think having those fat, that foundation as a young kid, then when I hit puberty late in life and then transitioning into college, you know, it's just really when I started to grow. So, um, you said you were you you were from where uh, Chad Nichols and his wife are from. Is that is that yeah. uh, Missouri? Then is that where you no, grew up? So they moved to Springfield, Missouri, when I was very young, um, during Kim's kind of the end of her heyday, because um, for more opportunities. But they were um, born and raised um, in this area, and Chad was a cop here. I think Kim's maybe first or second Olympia. They were here, um, and that's when she was still working full time. And he was working full time. And then they moved to um, Springfield, Missouri when I was very, very young. But, you know, my parents, we went to the same gym. My parents went to the same gym. And I can remember seeing them. And then I can just remember seeing them like out and about and like, man, like these guys, are, these guys look crazy. Like, how do I look like them when I get older? <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and for the listeners, uh, um, Brent's out in, in Illinois, just so, just so we're, uh, kind of tracking on the, on the same, yeah. uh, wavelength here. Now I want to talk about, uh, your parents. You said your dad played uh, professional baseball. What type of an influence were your parents in your life when you were younger? Yeah. And actually it's my stepdad, but he, my mom divorced my father when I was very young. Um, he was an abusive alcoholic. Um, so my stepdad was very, very different. Just a very, very, um, in tune guy with my life and he never treated me different than any of his kids which is very um looking back on that coming into a situation like that that says a lot of his character um so i had great parents growing up um you know they took care of me and they're always involved in my sports you know always drove me to practices and things like that and uh they were very very supportive of all my sports growing up i think now with bodybuilding 
my mom doesn't get it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like she was never like worked out or anything. She's like, she's like, I don't understand it, but cool. You know, they were able to see me turn pro this past year at nationals. And my, my dad gets it just because he was an athlete and he played at a very high level. Now, when he came into my life, he was done uh, playing baseball because he played 12 years professionally. Um, and actually it's his birthday today. So happy birthday. He'll be uh, 76. Um, so yeah, he came, I, I came into his life after he played baseball, but you know, he still coached all my teams, um, showed me the ropes in the weight room along with other bodybuilders who were local. And, um, yeah, I had a pretty, um, I had a pretty good upbringing compared to some of the kids who I see, um, teaching day to day in a public school setting. Yeah, for sure. One, one other question I want to ask you about the childhood. I um, mean, that is, um, pertaining to the type one diabetes, right? Right. Um, you know, obviously you talked about, you uh, kind of had to watch what you ate. You probably had some sort of a higher level of understanding of your body growing up. Um, did it, did having that uh, uh, diabetes and kind of having to do what you had to do to manage it and control it, did, did that affect you as a, as a kid? Was that something that um, other kids made fun of you about, or did you struggle with it? Or was it just kind of what you knew and it, it was no really big deal? I didn't struggle with it because I had it at such a young age and none of my friends, at least that I know of, made fun of me for having it, you know. Um, you really can't even tell that I had it back then because I would just take shots. Right now I'm on an insulin pump, so like the pump stays on my body unless, you know, I'm on stage or taking a shower in the swimming pool or whatever, you know. Um, so I never got made fun of for it. Um, and I got it at such a young age, I don't really ever remember a time not having it. You know, you see some kids who get it when they're a teenager and they rebel and say, why am I getting this? And it totally changes their way they live their life. But at a young age, I was just always taught, you know, look at the back of a food label, you know, look at the carbohydrates, measure things out, things we do in bodybuilding, right? That transition very easy to it. And I just always knew like, okay, I'm putting X, Y, Z into my body. My blood sugar's here. So I give myself this much insulin. Um, so actually transitioning to bodybuilding, you know, I already kind of knew what foods had in them. So it was kind of the easy transition over. Um, I will say though, you know, it's, it's been something good can always come out of something bad, but I'm glad at a young age, like I knew, okay, these foods were good for you. These foods were bad for you because I also teach health at high school level. And I always ask the kids the first question. I say, Hey, how many of you guys ever read a food label and even have any understanding of it? And maybe, a class of 30, one handle go up. And it's like, why aren't we teaching this? You know, we're teaching math that you will never use again in your life. Let's be honest for most people, but we're not teaching how kids like how to eat correctly or how to even read a food label. Like, I just think that's very, uh, that's very crazy on, you know, how we are in public education right now. For sure. And, and we're going to, we're going to discuss some more uh, uh, public education topics here in a, in a little bit. Now, um, you are a, a public a school teacher. So when you were in high school, things are wrapping up. Were you always kind of wanting to be a teacher or what was your mindset going into college? Let's kind of just unpack that. Yeah. So I, I'm kind of opposite of my other family members. So I have a sister who's a doctor and she knew since she was like five years old, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a doctor. I went to college just because I had good grades and I was like, well, I guess this is the next step, right? So I went to community college first and got my basics out of the way. And then when I had to um, choose a profession, I wanted to do, um, you know, uh, not athletic training, but I don't know some, some degree that was involved in sports. I can't think of it right now, but really a lot of those people when they graduate don't even have a job with it. So I had an advisor say, you know, have you ever, because at that time I was personal training um, and teach, teaching people things was always easy to me. I had an advisor say, have you ever thought about education? So um, anyways, I uh, said, no, not really. So I just kind of thought about it. I went and I shadowed some people. I said, I think I, I could be good doing this. Um, and I ended up saying, okay, I'll, I'll give it like a semester or two to see how I like it. Because a lot of times in your, your first few semesters of, being in the school of education you have to do shadowings and things like that i'll say we'll see how it goes and then we'll go from there so i ended up doing it and you know i liked it and i enjoyed it and luckily you know i'm in a profession that you know into this day I, I i like going to work so yes so let's let's talk about that because i mean you're an ifbb pro bodybuilder um you've been training you know since you were 14 and 
Uh, it's it's just a, it's it's unique to have somebody uh, with your credentials in terms of the the bodybuilding. Also, you know, being a being a teacher and kind of having a quote unquote normal job, so to speak. So um, talk about maybe your first teaching experience. Talk about some of those earlier years. Talk about, you know, maybe some of the things that teaching has taught you, not necessarily about bodybuilding, Brent, but just right. about life. Just just unpack those experiences because I, I uh, you know, I'm, I'm intrigued to hear about it. Well, first of all, I think teachers are not appreciated. I think one of the things I've learned is teachers aren't as appreciated as they should be in this country. You know, other countries view education and view teaching a lot differently than we do. Um, and that's not even to say it's all about, hey, yeah, they're, we're underpaid in a lot of states, but just the way America views education is very different than other countries. You know, other countries, they look at teachers as a little bit, you know, as a better profession. And, you know, a lot of other countries take education more seriously. Um, so my first teaching experience, I actually, that was when teaching jobs were hard to get. And when I graduated college, you know, there was only a handful of teaching jobs even out there in the state and in my area. So I knew a principal at a junior high and they needed a truancy teacher. So literally I was, um, I, my credentials were in physical education, driver's ed, health, K through 12. I literally, my first teaching job I took, I taught every subject other than PE, driver's ed and health. And I had self-contained kids who were truant with me all day long. And I tell you what, that was the hardest job that I've ever had. Um, you know, I felt the kids were from horrible backgrounds. A lot of their parents were drug dealers. A lot of the kids actually, it was really sad because these drug dealers would have their kids traffic drugs because they're minors. So if they got caught, they would spend a year in juvie and get out. Whereas if the parents got caught, they would spend 10 to 15 years in prison. So a lot of times they were using their kids to run drugs, you know, here, there, and everywhere. Um, and, you know, a lot of times parents teacher conferences, these parents would never show up. If they got suspended, you called home, they never answered the phone. It was a very, uh, it, it opened up my eyes because I wasn't raised that way. You know, I always knew that stuff was out there, but until you're in it, it's just a very sad um, job. Um, I will say, you know, I did have some success stories, but then there's also stories that just make you like want to pull your hair out. You know, a lot of those kids have no respect. They cuss you out. I mean, I got cussed out every day, multiple times a day. I um, broke up fights two, three times a day. You know, I'd be teaching a lesson then out of nowhere. Kids would be body slamming other kids through tables and chairs. And, you know, it's things that, you know, people don't want to talk about in education, but it happens in every you know, urban school district, you always have those kids. And literally most of them are with one teacher locked in a room all day long, you know, cause that's how they, that's how they handle things. I think they handle things a little bit differently now, but back then 15 years ago, that's what they did. Um, you know, there'd be some kids who had mental emotional issues. I had one time I was in a classroom and I was helping one kid on the computer and then the other kid unbeknownst to me. And, you know, I'm always, I'm juggling like 10 of these kids at once, right? And it's one teacher. I didn't have a teaching assistant, but she quit because she couldn't handle the job. She's like, I screw this, I'm out of it. <laughs> he gets on the roof and he's going and he's like, I'm gonna kill myself. And this kid's like 300 pounds and he is waddling. So I'm out there literally on the roof and dragging him back in the class. I mean, these are the kids that you're that you're dealing with. And uh, it was very eye-opening, very eye-opening. I'd have kids who'd bring weapons to school, I'd have kids who was very sad. They would get in trouble at school and they'd be suspended, but their home life was so bad. They would come to school and they would come to school. And obviously it's against a lot of be on school grounds. Um, and the cops would be called. And I actually had kids being tased in my classroom because they wouldn't leave with police officers. Um, it was just basically when you watch, what's, what's the old nineties movie with Michelle Pfeiffer, um, dangerous minds or whatever whatever that movie was like that was literally my teaching life for two years um i will be honest i got burnt out on it um and i had a grant funded position the grant ran out um so i wasn't fired it was just that there was no more money to pay me um i took a year off and personal trained full time and at that point i was like i don't know if i want to do this education thing because i can't see myself doing this for you know 35 years of my life then i was contacted by a principal in a more of a um 
rural farm community school district. And he was like, hey, we're looking for a PE, driver's ed, a health teacher. You know, I'm kind of one to transition the PE department from just rolling the ball out, playing with the kids to more of a weightlifting, you know, focusing on like nutrition, weightlifting and things they can take with them once they graduate. Can you just please come talk to me? But part of me was just like, I don't know if I want to do this again. I'm making pretty good money training people. Like, I don't know if I want to do this. I went in, he talked me into just giving it one year. So I said, okay, I'll give it one year and then we'll see what happens. And then fast forward, I've been with that school district for 10 years now. Um, and I'm just now finishing up my uh, master's degree in administration. So if I ever want to transition over and be a principal, I can. So I'm really glad that I did that just and gave it another chance because had I not, you know, I wouldn't have had the opportunity um, to teach in the school district that I am now and actually take the next step and um, finish my master's degree to actually take that next step at some point in my life. I love that, Brent. Now, we kind of were chatting a little bit before we turned on the, the, the mic here. So I want to ask you, um, for any of the listeners that don't know, I'm also a, a licensed PE teacher in the state of Colorado. I taught in public education for right around two years. So I'm very passionate about physical education within uh, public education here in, in America. So I want to ask you, uh, you, you kind of just talked about, you know, just rolling the ball and letting the kids play. Talk about how your PE or your physical e education at your school is different. And why don't you just touch on kind of your perspective and your feelings, emotions towards how PE should be uh, in our in our country, because from my perspective and my experiences, physical education is basically, you know, it's it's just it's it's a joke at, at most schools and in, in, in public schools in America. So why don't you take that and run with that for for a few minutes, please, Brent? Yeah, you know, and I think the reason why it's looked at as a joke is because if you look at standards like state standards and national standards, there's really none. They're just kind of like, well, do whatever you want with it. You got to have it, so do it. And I think that's just kind of the wrong way to look at it because we see obesity rates amongst young kids now. Like, I mean, I just, and I know it's even different even in our parents' time, but in our time, you know, you might have some kids who were overweight, but now at most public schools, the majority of your kids are overweight, you know? And I think the biggest thing that I have to get over with some parents is that they think, which I'm very well liked in my school district, but well, we don't want you to change, to make our kids bodybuilders. I'm like, I'm not making your kid a bodybuilder. Like I'm <laughs> teaching them how to take care of themselves once they graduate high school through nutrition, proper eating, how to go to a gym and weight train, how to, you know, track that, how to put cardiovascular, you know, um, how, how to do different cardiovascular things, whether it be running the mile, whether it be plyometrics, you know, how to look at a food label, how to do normal basic things so that hopefully that they will take it from, you know, more of a womb to tomb thing where, they'll have exercise and proper eating when they graduate high school and through high school all the way to, you know, when, when, when they die. And the thing is, as you know, as well as I do, is that there's so many classes that you take in high school, whether it be geometry or some of these upper level math classes, where if you're not going into a mathematical field, you will never use that again. I've never used like, for instance, a proof that I've done in geometry since high school, but every single person, whether you're an athlete, whether you're, you know, a just, you know, a skater kid or a video gamer or whatever, like you need to know how to take care of your physical body so that, you know, you can hopefully live a long and, you know, good life, you know? So, um, you know, a, a typical week at our school, they'll be in the weight room three days a week you know, doing a lot of compound movements, just learning how to do the movements correctly, you know, and you, you know, you'll have some athletes in class and you'll have the athletes with maybe a, you know, computer nerd, quote unquote. Um, and the cool thing is, is that since it's all individualized and they're not just playing a game where the athletic kids just take over, like a lot of those kids who might not um, participate that much in a game setting because they're not athletic, participate very well in when they're lifting weights because it's all individualized. They're not looking at each other and saying, well, I'm going to do more than you. Now, I guess you might have some athletes who say that, but most of 
all of my kids participate in class. I hardly have anybody no dress versus when I first had the job and we did game days, you know, all the time because that's the way the last teacher did it. We'd have a lot of kids not dress. I feel like all in all, a lot of kids enjoy doing it because, you know, they, they see the real world world aspect. Okay, I'm learning this in this class and I can take it with me. If all I'm doing is just rolling the ball out or playing basketball every day or kickball, how is that doing anything for me when I become an adult? So I think the transition into going that way is a smart way to do things. And maybe if we start that now, maybe when these kids are 30, 40 years old, they won't be having the, you know, diseases that some of the people are now having. And maybe, you know, also I personal train as well. And I also contest prep people. But, you know, when I personal train on the side, and I see some people who come to me and I just ask them, you know, what are they eating? You know, or do you know how to read a food label? They are, they have no clue. And I just don't understand why that isn't taught to everybody at a public school level, just so that they can understand like, hey, I might be putting this into my body, but I know better, you know? Yes, very, very well put. Now, one, one more question about teaching, and then we're going to start uh, transitioning into, into yeah. bodybuilding talk and, and training talk. But, um, you know, being a teacher as, as long as you've been, um, what do you feel like you have learned Brent, just about yourself, about life, about other human beings through those teaching experiences? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, that no matter what your upbringing is, that everybody needs to be loved and cared for. I know that's kind of a cliche answer, but, you know, a lot of times kids don't have the proper upbringing. A lot of times when they do come to school, um, that is their safe place. You know, like I said, I was lucky enough to, I had a great home. I had people who cared for me, but I think at, at the school grounds, you know, you know, you need to treat these kids, um, you know, all the same, regardless of where they come from. I think a lot of kids are different. A lot of kids are going through things that you might not be aware of. So I guess just always having, you know, open ears and uh, just having a genuine care for kids. And I'm at a school where we have a lot of great teachers, you know, some of these teachers who complain um, about, you know, kids or their job. I'm like, you know, you're not making a ton of money here. You can make this money elsewhere. Like, why are you here? So I just feel like if you are a teacher and you're there for the right reasons, then you will enjoy your profession. And then, like I've said before, you know, I don't make a ton of money teaching, but I do other things that make up for it. So, you know, me and my wife do more than, more than fine. Um, but I just think, you know, if you're there for the right reasons, then it's an enjoyable job. If you're not there for the right reasons, then I think that's why you have such a turnover in the, um, in education where a lot of people get out of it pretty quickly. Absolutely. I truly believe with, with everything inside of me that teaching is, is more of a calling than, than a job, right? It's right. something that you've really got to be uh, called to do. And the impact that you can have is, is um, insurmountable. And it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's an amazing opportunity if, if that's what you're called to do. If you're not called to do it, like you said, you're yeah, probably- there's nothing wrong with that. You know what I mean? Like, I think a lot of people think it's one thing when they start doing it, it's another. And if it's not for you, it doesn't mean you're a bad person or it doesn't mean that like, there's something wrong. It just means that like you, you're better suited doing something else, you know, and who knows, I might not teach the rest of my life, but right now I'm, I'm really enjoying it. And I feel like that I am, you know, called to do that. So if I feel like I'm getting burnt out or I need to change, then obviously I can go do other things. But, you know, um, I, I think that's just a thing in life too, you know, as long as you feel like that you're, you're doing what you should be doing um, and you get enjoyment out of what you're doing, then I think that, you know, you can't really go wrong if you, if you have that kind of mindset. hundred percent. All right. Let's uh, let's start talking bodybuilding. Yes, sir. Um, we, uh, we kind of touched on it earlier, but um, why don't you just tell us uh, Brent, you know, when your first show was, how old were you? And then why don't you just kind of talk about your, your competition history up to the point that you received your, IFBB Pro Card uh, last year, 2020, uh, at the Nationals. Yeah, so I started competing when I was 20 years old. Like I said, from um, I'd been in the gym. There's some bodybuilders in the gym. They said, you know, have you thought about bodybuilding? You think you could do pretty good? I entered my first show with no coach, no, no anything. So like, I was, <laughs> I was dieting like 
I had no idea what I was doing whatsoever. I didn't look horrible for not knowing what I was doing because, I mean, I don't have, at, at least at the local level, I didn't have horrible genetics. But looking back to how I got ready for a show, then how I get ready for shows now, you just learn. And I, I go back to saying, you know, not everybody back then had a prep coach. So you looked at your pictures and then you just researched on how to do things, whether it be through books or, you know, message boards or the guys at your gym just you figured it out. Right. So I competed um, when I was 20 years old. I think I, I placed second in the open heavyweights and I I think I placed second in novice too. I can't even remember. I got the trophy somewhere in here. And I competed every year since, right? So um, the first national show I did was in 2000 and gosh, 13 or 14. I was pretty young. It was, um, it was back then it was still called Team Universe. And I placed third in heavyweights. And after that, I thought to myself, you know, maybe I can, I never thought to myself, you know, I can be an Olympian, you know, but I thought to myself, my goal is now is I want to work on becoming an IFBB pro. That's my main goal. And anything above that will be great. Right. So fast forward to 2015, 2015, I placed first at junior USA's because even though team universe was um, a national show, I just felt like I needed to go back and do junior nationals when I felt like I was ready to kind of make a run um, to, you know, just see, you know, where I was at. Right. So um, I did junior USA's won my um, class and I lost the overall at like one point to Chris DiDomenico, which he won nationals, I think in 2018. Um, so the funny story is though, before that, two weeks before that show, I used the Illinois state show as a warm up show. I don't like saying warm-up show, but just, I just want to see how I did there and then did Junior USA's. And the funny thing is, and I wasn't in shape how I should have been, but I thought I should have done better than I did. I got third place in open heavyweights, right? And I was just like, man, should I, should I do this show? Should I, should, if I placed third in, in, in an open class at a state show, should I even do Junior USA's? And then I just said, you know what, I'm just going to buckle down and do whatever I need to do to become shredded out of my mind. Um, at that point, that's when I actually met Mandis Buckle, who was my first true prep coach. I had a coach before then, and he was my buddy, and he helped me out. He taught me a ton, a ton, a ton of information. But Mandis was like the first guy who did it as his profession. And he got me ready for Junior USA's. And I think in like two weeks' time, I lost like 15 or 16 pounds. And I was the most conditioned guy in the show. Won that, lost the overall um, slightly to Chris. And then the following year, I took that rest of the year off. And the following year, I did um, USA's and I placed fifth um, there. So that was my first true, like I always say, when you win your pro card at USA's, Nationals or North Americans, like the level playing field there is quite different than other shows, you know? And my goal was, hey, if I'm going to win my pro card, like I want to do it like the legit way, like, and I'm not saying that the others aren't legit, but you know what I mean? Like that's saying that you won your pro card. There's a little different than saying that you won it at whatever, at least to me. And, and if it does, if other people don't think that way to me, like I, you know, that's just how I viewed it. Right. So I got fifth there. Fast forward that same year I did nationals. Cause I was just like, okay, I got fifth. Like, let's see how I do it. Nationals my first time. So my first nationals experience, um, actually was really good. I, it started out in um, the middle, almost the whole time during prejudging. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, I'm gonna, am I, am I gonna win this thing my first time around? And then literally right at the end, they moved me one time over and then one time again. So I ended up placing fourth, right? And that was the year that uh, Dorian Haywood um, won the supers in that class. And then fast forward from there, um, I was like, okay, let's make some improvements. And then we did, what did we do that year? I think we did, um USA's again and I placed fifth and that's when no 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 sorry I did amateur Olympia one time and the amateur Olympia I did um was when Henry Jackson won and then I placed second in that class and to me I thought Henry should have won the overall there but another guy did and then fast forward to that that's when I did the USA's where Henry won his pro card and then Ron Gordon got second place that was an actually really loaded um class so I got fifth place there 
And then I was just kind of like, man, like I'm in the mix. First class always in the mix. Like, what do I got to do? Right. So then um, fast forward, my next national show was the year that Hunter Labrada won. And I thought of all the national, I, I, we really got myself pretty dang peaked right there. Cause looking back at pictures going into that show, I was like, okay, I know Hunter's going to win, but they give out two pro cards. Like if I get second, like, cool. Right. And going into it, like I was, I would look at his picture and say, man, like, is this guy just going to trash me when I get on stage? Like, he's really good. Right. And he just got fourth in the world, at the Olympia, like, come on now. So anyways, I did the show and, uh, I looked at pictures. I was like, and I thought I was getting second all day long. I had people come up to me saying, congratulations. I looked at pictures. I was like, you know, Hunter beat me, but like, I stood pretty good to him. And, and if you look back at those pictures, I did, he, he won, but I was very comparable there. Well, and I, I even felt better because a lot of people know, I'll still remember this Phil Viz and he's a friend of mine, but he gives it to me honestly all the time, you know, when I'm off, when I'm on, like, and he came up to me in the hotel. He's like, dude, like you gave, you gave Hunter a run. I'm like, what he's like well hunter b but you gave him a run you definitely have second place and so then i hear i am all day long thinking yeah i got second place well lo and behold sean smith got second place and i think beat me by one or two votes i don't know you could look back at the scorecards but it was pretty close then so then i was kind of you know i just kept knocking on the door of turning pro i'm like well what dang what do i gotta do so i i was almost i wasn't pissed at the judges and i wasn't pissed at anybody else but myself so fast forward to the next year's nationals, I was like, okay, I'm going to just going to get shredded as I can. You know, like, I don't care. I'm just going to be see through, like, I'm just going to go nuts. Right. Well, ended up over dieting that show and looked worse on lower food and everything, just because I was like, you know, I'd be doing even more cardio than what was on my plan. Just because I just thought to myself, I am not going to go to nationals again and not win. I'm always in the mix. Like I'm not going to do it. So that year I actually went down a place and got fourth place. And, uh, you know, and I, I say this not to bad mouth anybody whatsoever. And, you know, at the time, um, Mandis was still my coach. I worked with Mandis. I love Mandis. He's a brother of mine. Um, you know, to this day, I even do. Right. And I, I remember having a conversation with him and he said, and he, I think he was kind of upset too, because he went, he thought I should have done better, but he was like, and he knew I was upset. He's like, well, what poses did you win? And I was like, well, I think I won this pose, this pose, and this pose. He's like, no, you didn't. He just said, with your, he said, with your genetics, you might never win your pro card. And that stuck out in my head. And, you know, we're, we're friends to this day. Um, I'm in the same fantasy league as him. I still, I had worked, I was working for him for Maximum Muscle Report, doing an interview. So I don't say this to badmouth him at all. That was his opinion, right? But at that point, in my life, I was like, you know, I'm giving everything I have. I'm working more than full time. Like, I mean, I'm literally killing myself getting ready to compete at this level. Like I got to make a change. So during this whole time too, um, Chad Nichols had always been a friend of mine. Um, he had coached Autumn, my wife, some, um, he was always at nationals because he's Missouri's chairman. Um, we would always talk at shows, go out to dinner, things like that. And then I was so down and out and, you know, I kind of told Chad what was going on behind the scenes. And then he was just like, Hey man, he's just like, why don't you just come over? Just let you, he said, he said, I'm not saying you're going to be Mr. Olympia. I'm not saying you're going to get to the Olympia, but he said, I can get your pro card. He said, come over, let me work with you. You know, like, you know, cause I, you know, when somebody tells you that, who's your coach, you know, it kind of, you know, makes you, makes you, makes you think, am I, should I even be doing this anymore? You know, and again, this is not to bad mouth anyone. It's just literally the conversation that we had. Right. So I was like, okay. So, um, and man just taught me a lot. I learned a lot from him. Like I said, we're still buddies. He gave me tons of working opportunities. You know, he really made me a good bodybuilder. So fast forward, I ended up hiring Chad. I didn't really say a lot to a lot of people just because I didn't, you know, when people change coaches, I think they think, oh my gosh, like something horrible happened. Nothing horrible happened. It was just a difference of opinions. And I had been with Mandis for four years and he got me so close, but I just thought to myself, if I make this change, Chad's, in my opinion, is one of the best coaches to ever do it. Let's just see what'll happen. So, um, Going into 2020 nationals, everything was clicking. I looked a lot different, a lot better even than before. Um, 
and it was funny though i mean the whole time like i was feeling pretty confident like this is this is going to happen um and then pre-judging happened and when pre-judging happened the videos are on youtube or whatever somewhere i actually was in the first call out but i was in the fifth spot and i thought to myself not again like are you kidding me like every year like i'm always in the first call out i look good but it's just not good enough well anyways um Bundy, Bundy ended up winning. And he's, I, in my opinion, if he ever gets with the right coach, with his genetics, like he'll be a top five Olympian here in the next few years, um, just because his genetics are crazy. He kind of reminds me of the king, though. He has that thicker skin. So if he can ever nail the conditioning, like he's going to be lights out. I mean, because he's about 280 on stage with a 30 inch waist. And you can't, uh, you can't train for that. That's, that's called God given. So anyways, I was in the fifth spot. They call Bundy off by himself, like, because he just, literally killed everybody and then it was the rest of us and they kept posing us and posing us and they kept moving me over moving me over and it was really funny because on the lines typically when they line it they put like a box for each person to stand in well whoever lined it put like first second third fourth and fifth and sometimes they move you around differently but when they moved me finally to pre-judging and i was in the number you know the number two spot right I was thinking to myself, like, just don't move me again. Don't move me again. If I get off and I'm in this spot, like I did it, I got my card, right? So all of a sudden they said, okay, guys, we've, we've had enough. And I'm just like, thank you, God. Like, finally, like I was feeling good about it, right? Like, okay, I think I got it done. Um, but, you know, you always think that you're going to win. And I had been jaded before where I thought I was going to turn pro when Hunter turned pro. Um, so I was just chilling out um, all night long and looking at pictures and videos between, you know, the morning and night show. And then I went back to the night show and um, turned pro. And I just felt like the biggest monkey was off my back. Not that anybody else really put that pressure on me, but that was my goal and the pressure I put on myself. And then I just told myself, you know, um, I turned pro at the hardest show there is, in my opinion nationals that's like the you know the crown jewel of the amateur um portion of the npc portion and then now what I, whatever i do as a pro is just going to be you know gravy on the top for me i'm getting older a little bit older you know i'll be uh, almost 36 by the time i step on stage next year and you know as long as i improve and i get better and whatever happens now is just uh on top of the major goal that i wanted to achieve for myself so before we, uh, that, that was, that was very thorough. I, I appreciate you. Yeah. Sorry. I, I just was rambling. And then I was like, well, I'm already, I'm already pretty deep in here. So I might as well just keep talking, <laughs> but you know, that's to say I did a lot of shows before I turned pro. I was not a genetic anomaly who did two shows and turned pro. Like it took me a while just because I've had to work really hard for what I've gotten in this sport. And, and, that, and that's, it's perfect. I, I'm glad you were that thorough. Now, now touch on that, uh, Brent, because you know, you know, this, this podcast, it's, it's gaining a lot of traction. There's a lot of uh, young athletes that listen, I, other IFBB pros that listen. So speaking to uh, maybe the non-genetic uh, superior listener, right? Because that's the yeah. reality. Mo mo most of us are not, you know, genetically superior and, and set for bodybuilding. And we don't have the genetics of Hunter Labrada and things like that. So, but there's, 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 there's potential within all of us. I truly believe that, right? Whether it's bodybuilding or teaching, uh, you know, public education, there's potential within us all. So talk about how you mentally worked through competing in all of those competitions and you kind of just continued to move forward. Like what was your mindset? Like, how did you continue to push yourself forward and not quit? I think that just had to do with my mindset, almost growing up with my diabetes, if that made sense. Like I'm a person if I just never gave up, like when I was younger, I'd always achieve what I wanted to achieve. And I think that came from maybe not always having everything given to me in life. Um, with my diabetes, every day I have a choice. And, you know, I don't want to sound, you know, corny or whatever, but like, I can either like take care of myself, take care of a lot of the life that I've been given, what God's given me, or I can just say, okay, I'm not going to take my insulin or I'm not going to eat well. And then I'm just going to live a shorter life. Right. Um, and you just gotta, for most of us, you just gotta work and how bad do you want it really? You know, um, it's very hard for a diabetic to get into show shape. And I pride myself on that. Anytime I step on stage since 2014, like you're going to see somebody who's hard and shredded and I have to diet almost like a bikini athlete to get that way because 
I'm reliant on insulin to live. So I have to suck down so much um, so I don't have to be reliant on insulin. So I'm able to get rid of that last bit of body fat. It always cracks me up. You know, you have a lot of these super heavies that say, man, I'm on like 300 grams of carbs a day. I'm suffering. I'm like, I'm, I've been on like 50 for, you know, a month or, you know, I've had some days where I've gone zero and my fats are non-existent. I'm eating vegetables and fish every meal, you know, and it, it's just how bad do you want what you're going after? And to me, I wanted this is what I do outside. This is my fun, right? Lifting weights is my fun. It's my release. Bodybuilding is what I love to do. So I knew in order to achieve my goal, I was willing to eat dog crap if I had to, or do three hours of cardio a day at midnight, um, if that's what it took to get there, you know? So I, I just think that, you know, instead of giving yourself an easy way out, you just do what you have to do to get the job done. And, uh, you know, I... I think what helped me in all these shows is that it wasn't like I was like second or third call out. I was always placed. I always was just like this close. So it just made me want to push harder and harder and harder um, to try to, you know, to try to achieve my goal, you know? So, and it was, and you know, then another thing people ask me is, well, well, was it worth it? Yeah. I mean, the feeling of achieving the goal that I had set out for myself, knowing that, you know, like you said before, the Hunter Labrada or, these top Olympians, their genetic pool is like 0.0001%. Like when you go up against a guy like that, you know, it's going to be hard to beat, but the majority of us have to work. And I'm not saying Hunter doesn't work as Hunter does work, but the majority of us have to really dig deep um, to get, to get what we get in life. hundred percent. Now I want to talk about uh, Chad Nichols. How did he, um, kind of change things up for you and how was he a, a, a difference maker in in that prep leading up to you earning your IFBB pro card um I think with Chad and you know and I think how do I want to say this for Chad for me was always he was always a friend to me but it was always someone who I looked up to with the utmost respect and I think that's important when you have a coach, right? And I looked up to Mandis too. Um, but, you know, you got to hire somebody and you have to be with someone who like you want to try to impress. Like, so every time I sent check-in photos, every time I sent in things, I'm like, this guy has coached Ronnie Coleman, all these Olympians. I know I'm not going to impress him, but like, I want to do my best to impress him because I don't want him to be like, Oh, well, he's not following the plan or, Oh, he looks like dog crap. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so and he, and Chad makes you check in, especially in prep quite often. Um, so every time I sent those pictures, I was like, I better be showing improvements. Right. So I think that really helped a lot just because I, even though I knew I wouldn't impress him, like <clears throat> in my mind, like I, I, that was my mindset going into it. So that helped a lot. Um, I think he knew that I was so close for so many years. I think the reason why he brought me on, other than, you know, we're, we're friends, is that he really wanted to help me, you know, get over the hump because I've been so close for so long. Um, and I think the biggest thing that he did is that we always were changing the diets. And I followed whatever he said 100% just because I knew he knew what he was doing. Um, so rather, you know, there'd be weeks where, you know, I would – just be starving, right? And then typically, you know, a lot of coaches, you know, during prep was once you hit that starving mark, they just ride that out until the show, which, you know, or pretty early on in prep, we would have a week or two that was really, really hard. Then he'd give me a week where I had a little bit more food. So it was almost kind of like a yo-yo. Like we would like eat a little bit and then drop back down, eat a little bit and then drop back down. And I feel like that approach is different than most coaches. So I just feel like most coaches just kind of stair step your food down and then like the last few weeks you're literally eating nothing and then I think you know um sometimes you hit a hole if you're really that far depleted then when you know you do your water manipulation and you carb load back up sometimes you can't get out of that hole to look the way that you need to look so um, I, I think that was kind of you know some of the biggest things um, that he had me do. Um, another big thing that he had me do as well is my protein portions were insane. Um, I was eating so much to where I was like, I can't get this in. And he knew with my diabetes, we couldn't push carbs probably as hard as he would want to, or that we really needed to just because with more carbs, I got to use more insulin. 
with my protein portions, you know, protein has very little effect on blood glucose levels. So um, a lot of times I'd be eating my off season, like 12 to 14 cooked ounces, you know, five times a day with either, I think usually like my last meal at night, he would either throw in like two or three cups of muscle egg, um, which is one of my sponsors, <laughs> or he would be like a protein shake or something like that. So just the amount of protein that I was ingesting, um, I, I think the dieting down and kind of the yo-yoing effect and the amount of protein that I was putting in my body was more than I ever had in my life. Now, uh, I want to I wanna just discuss here, um, or I would love to hear from you, Brent, um, you know, kind of the future plans. You said uh, competing in the pro ranks is going to be kind of like the, uh, the, the icing on top, so to speak. Do you have uh, some plans moving forward to compete in some IFBB pro shows? And, and what are you thinking right now? Yeah, so I ended up taking this past year off of competing. I didn't compete in 2021 just because uh, I felt like when I get on a pro stage, I want to be comparable. I'm not saying I'm going to win a show, but I think my goal now, I have a new goal that, you know, for my first show, and this might be a little bit lofty, but it all depends who shows up. I would like to be in the first call out. Um, the top of the second call out would be great for me. Um, that would be a win in my books for the first show I'm going to do or the second show. So I think we're going to do, I know we're going to do Indie Pro next year if everything is okay. Um, and then based off that, and it's going to be based on where the New York Pro is. Um, if things are still shut down like they are, I don't want to go to New York and I don't want to go to California. Um, but if they're, if they're in different areas of the country like Florida or some place that's a little bit more free, um, I'll probably go down there, but I don't want to wear a mask on stage. <laughs> I just don't like, I refuse to like, no, thanks. I'm not going to do it. Right. Sorry. If you're of a more liberal mindset, but I, that's just something I'm not going to do, which is a free country. So we can do what we want. Um, so in saying that I'm probably going to do, uh, indie and then one of those shows afterwards and just kind of see how I do. And that's just kind of my goals going forward. I'm really glad though, that I didn't compete this year because, um, through my diabetes, I actually had uh, diabetic retinopathy. I've gone through three surgeries on my eye, um, pretty major surgeries. I have another surgery coming up here in a few weeks. So even if I would have planned on competing this year, there's no way that I could have done that with everything that I've gone through, uh, with my health. So. Now, I want to ask you about um, your, your wife, Autumn. She's also an IFBB pro, correct? Correct. Yeah, correct. So, so talk about, obviously, Chad, um, you know, and, your, your, and, and Mandis have been big parts in your, your bodybuilding career. But just uh, studying up a little bit before we had our conversation on your Instagram, um, I can definitely tell that Autumn's been a big part of, of that team and a big part of your life and a big part of con continuing to push you forward to get that pro card. So just talk about her and uh, what she has meant to you, not just as obviously a bodybuilder, but, you know, just as, as a man and just having her as a part of the team. Yeah. So uh, we've been together. I'm 35. She's 37. We've been together for 15 years. How it all started was uh, we both use Beverly International products. I don't know if you are familiar with them, um, but it's a supplement company and they always brought out newsletters. Right. And uh, so anyways, um, she was in the newsletter and when I was like 20 years old, this was before, like, this wasn't Facebook. You like, I think you still had to have a college email to even access Facebook. That's how old, how long ago this was. So anyways, uh, I read the article and she talked a lot about her faith and I could just tell in reading that, like that she's just a really, cause I'm a person, I'm a Christian man. Um, she's a Christian woman. And I could just really tell through that article that, um, she was just, you know, kind of ha kind of thought the way that I thought and at that time at least around here like there's nobody to date like I wasn't a big partier you know it, during college if I wasn't working I was at the gym or I was working to make money to get myself through college um so I felt led and I messaged her on Facebook and I was like how do I make this come across without being super creepy <laughs> and this was before like this was before uh, people catfish people and all that <laughs> stuff. Cause it was like the beginning. It was like right after MySpace, right? So who knows? I might even still had a MySpace profile at that point. So I found her on there and I messaged her and then she messaged back. And then, uh, you know, I was getting ready for a show 
And then as we were messaging each other back, she's like, well, I would wish you good luck, but I don't have your phone number. And I was like, okay, I'm in. If she's asking for the phone number, like we're good to go. So anyways, it went on from that. My sister at the time was in medical school about an hour away from where she lived in Kentucky. I drove down there, we met, we spent the weekend together and then um, everything just kind of happened from there, from there and we've been together ever since. So it's funny that we actually met each other through a Beverly International um, newsletter. So, you know, I, I'm really, uh, I'm just, we're very happily married. It doesn't mean that we don't have issues, but um, she's my best friend. We're, we're, we're very much alike as a person. And uh, I think sometimes that can be a bad thing or a good thing, you, you know, if you're too much alike, but for us, it ends up working. Um, I'm her biggest fan. She's my biggest fan. Um, I think what, I think as far as bodybuilding is concerned, seeing how much success she had, I wanted to like, it kind of pushed me because I was like, well, I don't want to be a chump. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to just suck at, at this. So, um, you know, you know, she won, gosh, she turned pro in 2010, actually in fitness and then went to women's physique and she won the Arnold and then she won like six pro shows and was a top 10 Olympian four times. And during all that, like I, that's when I was, you know, competing and doing well at nationals. I was like, man, like, she's doing like Olympian stuff and I, gosh, I can't even get a freaking pro card. So I, I think in doing that, even though like she never put pressure on me, it was a pressure that I put on myself. I was like, okay, like I know I'm good enough. I can at least turn pro like at a real show, not masters nationals or something like that. I know I'm going to get slammed for saying that, but to me, that's what I wanted to do. Um, so, you know, yeah, I just kept pushing and pushing and, you know, it, you know, during prep, it's very important if you're dating somebody or married to somebody, they know what you go through. Because those last few weeks, if you dated or were married to somebody who didn't understand the sport, like it would kill your relationship. So I think there's times, you know, when you give and take in a, in a marriage or a relationship. For instance, when I'm four to seven weeks out from a show, she knows that I'm not going to talk much. I'm not going to be home much. Like I'm going to be pretty moody. I'm going to be pretty hard to get along with. But I just need that time to get to where I need to be to compete and do my thing. And then I'll be back to myself after you give me a little bit of food, <laughs> you know, and the same for her too. Um, you know, you just have to give each other that leeway. It doesn't mean there won't be arguments or fights, but I think at the end of the day, if you know that you're both hundred percent committed to a relationship um, that, that, you know, that, that it's good. And I think in our case too, it helped that we, had to do the long distance thing for quite some time with her living in Kentucky. And if you do a long distance relationship and you don't trust the other person, like forget that it's just not going to happen. So um, I think that's the reason why in this sport, you see a lot of people who can't make it if they both compete. But I think those few things, at least in our circumstance are why we have a pretty, I don't want to say perfect. It's not perfect, but we have a healthy, good, you know, marriage to this day. So awesome. So the same question, we're going to start heading towards the finish line because we've been going yeah. for about an hour. I want to be respectful of your time. No, but, this is um, good. Good stuff. Cool, cool. Um, so kind of this, the same question that I asked you earlier about uh, teaching, I want to ask you about bodybuilding. So what do you feel like bodybuilding has taught you? What has bodybuilding uh, given you in terms of just life? Discipline, 1 million percent discipline. Um, when I was younger, and in college and an undergraduate, like I wasn't a party or anything, but I was a procrastinator, right? Here, my dog is in the background. Oh, that's all um, good. <laughs> Benji's making the YouTube. Um, but you know, the, um, it would be for me, um, I would do homework late. I do it the night before. I would be five minutes late to class. You know, just, just, just the discipline part, right? And now from the bodybuilding, how disciplined for someone like me to get to where I've had to be, like that does, doesn't do in bodybuilding, that transitions to the rest of your life. For instance, now, you know, in my master's program, like I am like the first to get done with my homework assignments. I have straight A's like, and I'm just, and it's funny when you like reflect. Cause I'm like, man, when I was an undergraduate, like I would skip class and not really care. And, you know, put it this way. If I could go make 50 bucks personal training someone or go to class and the teacher didn't even take role, I was gonna make the 50 bucks that was me, right? So I, mean, I didn't make horrible grades in undergraduate, it was A's and B's and an occasional C, but it's just the discipline that you learn in bodybuilding. If you, I always tell people, if you do bodybuilding the correct way, 
diet, nutrition, training, and the discipline that takes to take it all the way to your body, you get the 100% out of your body, it's the most rewarding feeling that I've ever experienced in life. And it doesn't just stop there, it will bleed into your relationships. It'll bleed into the way that you treat other people. It will bleed into every other aspect. And I think that's the biggest positive that I've gotten from the sport is just the discipline and knowing that, hey, like I did the hardest thing ever getting ready for a show, um, one of the hardest things. So, you know, if, if I can do this, everything else just kind of is, is, is pretty easy at that aspect. And, you know, I'm, I'm somebody too, I don't blow smoke up, you know, people's butts. I mean, bodybuilding I, at this level, I would not say is healthy. You know, it can be healthier than, you know, what other people do. But um, I would say the, the biggest, you know, plus out of that is the discipline level that you get. Who's uh, somebody on the current IFBB circuit that you would love to step on stage with and be, be compared with? <laughs> uh, me and, uh, it's funny that you say that, me and uh, Boston Lloyd's a buddy of mine, a lot of people. And the thing with Boston is that he's way different one-on-one -on -one versus what he portrays online and people are like you guys are friends you're so different I'm like yeah we're good friends but we joke and then me and my wife joke as well she's like okay now you need to go on a revenge tour and that everybody who turned pro before you like that should be your goals to beat them so and I even joke with some of these people because they're my friends right like I know you've had Matt Kuba on here and uh Dr. Dorian and all those guys and we're we're all good buddies and, you know, but in my mind to get me to the place where I need to be to get his condition and be my best, like I'm eyeing those guys. Cause I know I'm not going to go into Indy and like win the thing. Like that would be crazy to think that, right? Nobody wins the show on their first, you know, go around. But if I can be compared to those guys, and if I can beat the guys who turned pro before me, for me, that'll be, uh, that'll be a uh, redemption. <laughs> that, you know, that, that kind of reminds me, that's kind of like the, uh, the Tom Brady mindset, right? You know, he was yeah. picked so far back and you know, all you ever hear is that Tom Brady's mindset is still like, he's going out there and he's, he's going to ball out. He's going to beat everybody. And look, look, I mean, he's had a 22 year career. So yeah. that, that kind of popped up in my mind when you were saying Yeah. That. And Jordan too. I don't know if you watched the Jordan documentary where he would pick, he would like make up in his mind that these other players were saying things about him, like to get him like amped up to go. And, uh, you know, in my mind, like I have to have a goal and I know a lot of those guys are doing indie. So like in my mind, I'm like, when I don't want to be at the gym and when it's hard, even like right now, it's like, okay, like, you know, the guys who turn pro before you, they're at the gym right now. Like how hard are you going to push? You know, what are you going to do to try to beat these guys? So you can get a little bit of redemption on your side. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. And I've, I've had, uh, a lot of those guys that you brought up that have beaten you. And they're good dudes. Like I said, we're all friends, but you yeah. know, like I, I wouldn't be lying if I said that I don't want to beat them, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of them have been guests on the podcast. And I was actually talking to somebody the other day that's, uh, I think they're going to make their pro debut at the Indy Pro because I'm I'm in Iowa. I mean, uh, Indiana's not that far away. And I was like, you know, I think it would be pretty cool for me to be able to come to the Indy Pro and see a lot of you guys. Yeah, and that would be so cool too. And that's one of the reasons why I picked it. Well, I picked that show for a number of reasons. Number one is I think Dave Bowers is a great human being. Um, I just think he's a super nice guy. He's in the sport for the right reasons. He's a fan himself. He competes himself. Like he is just a good guy inside the sport and out and I like to uh you know I like to support those guys you know me doing the shows not going to bring him a lot of money but I'm just saying that like if I have to make if I have to compete somewhere I want to do it with a guy like Dave um and, and saying all that too you know all these national shows there's none in the midwest like other than my parents going to see nationals none of my friends none of my family have actually my training partner came out to miami with me for nationals but you know now a lot of people can just take off work for four or five days and go see a bodybuilding show so it'll be nice for a lot of my family and friends to be able um to see me there's a joke at the gym they're going to rent a, a school bus and bring a bunch of people there so i said well maybe if you chant my name enough it'll help me it'll boost me up a few spots <laughs> yeah for sure that's that's uh that's what steve kuklo does man he he brings like a whole a whole uh, a whole crew and stuff that's, yeah that's, yeah i think that's that, that's awesome it's awesome for the sport and you know it's awesome to get people involved who don't understand the sport as well and just help it grow because if it's ever going to grow like you need you need that you know that to, to help it grow you know for sure all right brent we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up here 
Um, I want to give you an opportunity to kind of maybe just share any final thoughts, any final words with the listeners. And then obviously, um, you've got Muscle Egg uh, shirt on there. I know that's one of your sponsors. Why don't you share your sponsors, where people can find you, connect with you, and anything else that you kind of want to put out there, and then we'll we'll close it out. Yeah, for sure. So uh, Muscle Egg has been our, gosh, me and my wife's main sponsor for years. Um, Paul and Ruben, they're just awesome individuals, human beings. And something that me and my wife always says that we don't, st- we will not take money from a company unless we actually use the product. So we had used Muscle Egg far before. Before we were ever sponsored by them. Um, Condemn Labs, I also have an affiliation with them as well. Um, if you guys want any codes or whatever, I never push that on people, but just go to my Instagram, um, which is Brent Swanson with an E-N, or just DM me, you know. Um, I, I'm i someone like, I, you know, if you, if you like the product, cool. If you don't, like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be some bikini girl with the product every day, posting pictures. That's just not me. It, it, and it'll never be me. Um, so th- those are my sponsors. Uh, I just would like to see the sport of bodybuilding continue to grow. It's just given me so much in my life. You know, I think the thing that I am, I don't want to say struggling with, but I know I'm 35, I'll be 36. I will continue to compete as long as I'm healthy and as long as uh, I progress. And that doesn't just mean in placings, but as my body progresses. But, you know, I think the thing that you know, I don't want to say scares me is that I have given so much of my time to this sport and I love the sport. I think, uh, um, going forward, like it's going to be hard to replicate that with anything else in my life. So, um, I just know how much I love the sport and I've given to the sport. And I just think that the sport there's positive and negatives, but the positives, at least to me far outweigh, you know, some of the small negatives. So if you're looking for something to really delve yourself into, to keep you motivated, keep you disciplined, I mean, just to really push your body as far as it can be pushed to to reach your genetic potential. I think um, if it's done the proper way, um, that can be a great thing. So, uh, you know, there's support this podcast. A lot of these guys I know that you're interviewing are very good individuals, very solid individuals. If you reach out to any of them, they will take the time and um, help you out with whatever you need. So, yeah, that's uh, it's been a good talk. I've, I've really enjoyed it. So. Yeah, no, th- thank you, Brent. If um, somebody is, uh, you know, from Illinois, kind of your area, or if somebody listening wants to reach out to you in terms of like training, uh, you know, uh, prep, uh, coaching, stuff like that, is that something just they can reach out to you through your Instagram? Yeah, and, and, and I, I, I'll be honest, I hand select people, and I hand select people not based on ability, but based on how good of a match I think you're going to be. Um, I have lifestyle people, I have regular clients. Um, I will say though, I work full time. I'm finishing up a master's degree. Um, I'm getting ready for a show myself. So if I think we'd be a great match and I think you can stick to a plan and that you will give it your all, that to me is what I want. You know, there's nothing worse than working with someone and they're not serious. And I've even had people who are bodybuilders who my lifestyle people are more serious than they are. You know, so I kind of do kind of vet people. And if I think that they'll actually follow the plan, I'm more than willing to help out, you know, and and it can be a great thing, you know. Um, So if people want to reach out to me um, or my wife as well, just go to my Instagram, Brent Swanson, just shoot me a DM. Also, my email is very easy to remember. It's Swanson, S-W-A-N-S-E-N, period, Brent, at gmail.com. And uh, like I said, if I think that I can help you out, I'll be more than willing to help. Or if I think that somebody else might be able to help you, I'll refer you to somebody else as well. So. Very cool. Brent, thank you so much for taking some time to pop it up with me. All right. Have a great day and enjoy your Saturday. For sure. Listeners, um, those of you on YouTube, thank you so very much once again for tuning in, listening. Um, If it wasn't for you guys, this podcast wouldn't exist and it wouldn't be uh, gaining the traction that it is right now. So thank you. Two favors I'd ask of you, if you haven't done so already, make sure you hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Also, please uh, leave a comment in the in the YouTube comment section in terms of what was your favorite part about Brent's uh, story? Um, what was something maybe that you took away from Brent sharing his story today with all of us? Just leave that in the YouTube comments. Greatly appreciate it. And then finally, um, if you guys would take Brent's episode, this episode of Behind the Muscle, share it on all of your social media platforms. Make sure you tag Brent. 
and also tag behind the muscle. That is also something that helps more people find the podcast, more people are going to listen and more people are going to be positively impacted. And that's really what this is all about. Bodybuilders, coaches, uh, athletes sharing their stories so that people would listen and be positively impacted. And then I will leave you all with this. Remember behind the muscle, there's always a story. We'll catch you guys later.